brilliant. Well, we're just about to start this this webinar, so I would like to welcome everybody to this evening's session. I'm going to start the recording um, for the for the YouTube. And apologies from uh, from Andy Simmons. He's uh, he's in uh, Egypt at the moment on holiday, sunning himself and probably at the free bar. So um, he might he said he might sign in and come and say hello, but I'm not so sure myself. Um, I want to welcome Kevin. You, most of you will probably have, have seen Kevin do a couple of presentations last year. Uh, and we've got Paul Bardo in as well, who's going to assist with some of the more uh, obscure questions, possibly, Paul, might be the thing, if uh, if Kevin struggles with them. Well, as long as it's not on modelling, we'll be fine. Absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. we've got, uh, we'll have abuse from uh, Mr Ellison in the crowd. And um, yeah, with further ado, without further ado, actually, before I do say that, Please, if you could just put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, that will make it a lot easier for Paul and myself to order the questions later to help Kevin to, to answer them. Um, the chat box is for abuse, really. And um, yeah, we should look forward to that. Kevin, let you crack on. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Mark. Uh, th thanks for the introduction and, uh, and welcome. So um, great to see so many people here again. Um, Many of you, I would expect, um, may have watched my sessions in the first um, couple of seasons of this, um, where I covered uh, the basics of uh, aerobatic flying, um, radio control aerobatic flying, and uh, why I, I think it's a it's a great branch of our sport or, or hobby, or call it call it whatever you will. Um, and I covered a, a little bit about setting up an aeroplane in 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 basic terms and when I came to think about a topic for this season um, I reflected on what, what I've learned during some training sessions over the last couple of years run at Buckminster uh, which have been for, a, for quite a wide range of uh, experience and ability uh, and I'm often asked to help with setting up an aeroplane uh, and usually I'm presenting with the aeroplane and I switched on transmitter um, and, I, and I waggle the control surfaces and, and then about an hour later I emerge with, with everything reprogrammed and, and then we go off flying. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've no wish to, to criticise anybody that's, uh, that's asked me to do that, but I have seen some setups where I thought that um, a little bit of guidance would help um, and uh, attacking it from first principles um, is, is usually the best way to go. So without further ado, I'd, I'd better just move on to the next slide and talk about some of the parameters that, that I'm working to this evening. Um, it, it's, it's about fixed wing aircraft. If there's any helicopter experts on here, you will run circles around me because you, you guys are, all use all sorts of mixes and programs and, and the full capability of a computer radio, much of which is, is beyond the scope of what, what I know and what I would use for fixed wing. So, um, given that it's my main discipline, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the basic setup for a fixed wing aerobatic plane. I'm not going to focus on the top range radio because I know that the majority of people don't have those. So I've picked a mid range radio. Um, and as you can see, it's the Fataba 16 SZ. Um, now, clearly other great brands of radio equipment are available. We'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, in a little while. Um, it, it's, it ought to be fairly obvious to say that, that just about anything you buy nowadays is of great quality um, and its capabilities are far, far in excess of, of anything from 20, 30 or for those who have been around as long as me, uh, 40 plus years ago when servo reversing and rate switches were, uh, were, were just a dream to, to a lot of people. So there's a typical radio, um, the, the 16 SZ, um, and that and its contemporaries from other brands have got loads and loads of programming capability, far more than most of us will ever need. Um, and that in itself can be an issue because there's a lot of things you get tempted to use, um, but you can, you can end up, as I've said in the heading here, you can end up programming your way into trouble rather than out of it. So I'm going to concentrate on the things that I think are the most useful uh, and my advice is to leave the rest alone. And when you become very proficient at programming the basics, then um, 
you, you can move on to experimenting with the rest. I'm going to describe a way of programming a radio. Um, it's one way. There are others, uh, but I think it's a decent starting point. So, uh, so let's move on. Before we talk about programming uh, a, a transmitter, um, I, I just want to stress it's, it, it's complementary to rigging and measuring and setting up your airframe correctly. So it makes trimming easier, but it's not a substitute for checking the center of gravity, adjusting your incidence angles, uh, checking lateral balance and adjusting side thrust and down thrust. Th those things, they all go hand in hand. And while you can program out a lot of deficiencies, there are some things that you, you just cannot do. So you can't program, as I've said, a more forward or rear with center of gravity. Um, if it's too far back, your plane will be unduly sensitive and there's no amount of programming is going to help that. Uh, and there'll be other unwanted uh, you know, characteristics as well. So it's, it's a tool, but it's not the tool. I'm going to move on to the, some definitions of the terminology we'll use. Uh, and, and I've touched on the different brands of radio. So uh, obviously this is, this is based around Fataba set and, and the, the terminology is what they use. Other brands use different terminology, but uh, if you use those brands, you'll be able to work out what I'm talking about in terms of ATVs and AFRs and things like that. And the basic principles are just the same. So the things I'm gonna run through, uh, some briefly and some in detail. Uh, sub trim is a function that adjusts the neutral position of a servo, if you uh, feel the need to do that. Uh, there's a function called ATV, adjustable travel volume, and that, uh, as, as it says, it sets the throw of each servo or channel in, in, in each direction. Um, another one is called AFR, which is adjustable function rate, and that uh, also sets the throw uh, and, and a number of other things. You can change the response curve of the servo, uh, and that includes things like exponential um, and functions like line and spline, although I'm not going to go into those latter in, in any detail. Uh, Fataba has a thing called flight conditions, which uh, allows the uh, a choice of different responses for one or all of the, uh, of the channels on the, on the radio that you can use in different phases of flight. We'll go into a little bit of detail about that. Um, and, and finally, just to say that the, uh, I've mentioned ATV and AFR, the big difference between them uh, is the adjustable travel volume is, is a one-off setting that you make uh, early in your, your programming sequence, uh, and it applies in any flight condition. Uh, but if you use AFR, you can set that for each flight condition, and that, that's where the programming capability is our most useful. So we'll, uh, we'll touch on that a little later. Uh, that shows uh, the, the model menu screen on, on the Fataba radio, uh, and you see things like servo monitor. I think most, uh, most brands have something like that. And that just is a quick view uh, on that screen of, of the output to each servo. So you can, you can watch what your surfaces are going to do uh, without actually switching the, uh, the receiver on. Uh, there's a function called dual rate, which is uh, one of the first things that was available on, uh, on programmable or computer radios uh, many, many years ago. Um, it, it's similar to AFR, but um, it, it's one that I don't actually use very much uh, because AFR does most of, of what you need. Uh, but it, you can switch between do two different response rates for, uh, for one function. So if you want sensitive ailerons, you'd have a high rate uh, and a softer aileron response would be, uh, would be a low rate. Uh, exponential or expo for short, that, that alters the response of the servo. I'll show that on a graph in a moment. Um, and you generally want to do that so that there is less sensitivity of the servo around neutral um, compared with the response around the larger stick deflections, which can, you can use to smooth out your, uh, uh, your, your, your normal straight and level flight. And then we get into the more powerful functions. There's mixing uh, and that enables uh, two or more functions to, to work together with, with a single stick input or a switch input. Uh, and we use that in fixed wing aerobatic flying and, and, and in other classes, no, no doubt. 
uh, for correcting for unwanted aerodynamic characteristics. So we'll, we'll give a couple of examples of that a bit later on because they're built into the, um, the the functionality of the radio. If you look, just just as a teaser, you've got things like rudder to aileron mix and rudder to elevator mix, and they're they're very common ones that, that are used in aerobatics. And uh, it'd be remiss of me not to talk about failsafe. Um, failsafe functions available on all, all radios that I'm aware of, and that sets a predefined control response if you lose the signal to the receiver. And I just want to stress that if, if, if your receiver power supply is lost, um, you, you might not get a failsafe response. Um, but there is a requirement, and, and we should all do this to ensure that if it's an IC engine, it goes to idle. Um, and if, if it's an electric powered aircraft in the UK, um, the motor must stop completely um, on the fail safe. And you have to set up your radio to make that happen. It just doesn't happen automatically. Um, so bear that one in mind. There's, there's many ways of uh, different varieties of fail safe available. So I've not gone into a specific example on that, uh, but it's something that every, every radio control pilot should know. Okay, we'll move on again. Um, what I'm going to talk through is an example setup. It's what I would call a, 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 a sport aerobatic plane. I've, I've shown a, a, a Sebat, Sebat here. I've used that on my previous presentations. Uh, that, that's a, a, a 30 size plane that I've got there. Um, it's got two alien servos, one in each wing, which is very common nowadays. It also has two elevator servos, which is quite common as well. Uh, and a single rudder servo and obviously an electric motor ESC. Um, and because I haven't got 90 minutes for a presentation, I'm, I'm not going to go into setting up individual servos to match each other. I'm going to assume that you've got decent quality servos and they're, they're well matched. And if you plug them in the same channel, they'll, they'll throw the same left and right and up and down um, and, and they match each other. Um, Nowadays, servos are, are really good quality. As I say, mo most things are much better than they were 20 years ago. Um, but it is worth saying that <clears throat> if you buy a £10 servo, that the, there may be a little bit more throw one way than the other compared to if you buy a £100 servo. Generally, you're paying for more power and faster response when you, when you spend more money on a servo, but you're also paying for uh, better centering uh, and a more even response either side of neutral. But... Uh, most servos nowadays are really, really good. I've got some small servos that I bought for electric pylon racers, and they are absolutely top class. They, they throw exactly the same each way, um, and, the, and the centering is excellent. So you don't have to spend hundreds, uh, but I know some applications that you need a lot of power, and, and you do spend that. So that's the uh, that's the basis of the setup I'm going to talk through. So uh, off we go. Let's go programming. Um, the key thing is, you use as much as you need, but no more in, in terms of your, your programming functions. Um, you, you still should do most of it on, on your linkages and on the servo itself. So I've shown a couple of Fatava servo arms there, the forearm on at the bottom, the six arm at the top. Um, and if you switch a servo on uh, with, with your radio with, with nothing, no, no trims put in, no sub trims or anything like that, and pop your servo arm on, you should be able to find a position where you can get uh, a pair of arms at right angles across the servo. Um, for Tata servos and others, others will be similar, they've got 25 splines, you've got 25 different positions to, to, to rotate each of those uh, uh, servo arms around. And you should be able to get, probably within a degree, um, uh, get, get the arm at right angles across. And, and if you don't need the other arms, just snip them off and then, then you've got it set up. And that saves a lot of messing around programming uh, and, and setting sub trims and things to get your servos uh, centered properly. And then, and, and you've heard me say this before, if you've heard any of my previous presentations, adjust your linkages and clevises uh, to, to match that neutral servo position to get your control surface in neutral. So, you really shouldn't use sub trim at all. Um, so that's the, that's the first point I'm going to make, which might, uh, might surprise one or two, since it's an easily available function. So there's, there's a couple of setups. That's, uh, that's my F3A plane, which is a biplane on, on the left-hand side with a six-arm for Tarver on it. 
uh, ZBEN through it and a clevis at the end, and that's set at zero sub trim. Uh, and as you can see, it's just about at right angles. It might be degree off slightly in the, the outer clockwise direction. It might be just the angle I took the photo. Um, the one on the right is the uh, is the Seb Art plane with uh, with a different brand of servo in there, and that's got a single arm, and that's that's pretty much at right angles again with the linkage adjusted. So you should be able to achieve that and you've not touched anything on your radio yet. So um, next up is, is what the screens look like on the transmitter. That's the, that's the home screen on, on the 16SZ. Um, and I've shown you the servo monitor screen and it shows the layout of the channels as it sets uh, in default for a two aileron and two elevator aircraft. So if you look across the bottom on the right hand picture here, you've got aileron channel one, uh, elevator channel two, they're usually the left of the pair. Um, throttle, that's, that's set at, uh, throttle's reversed on, on, on Futaba radios generally uh, for, for speed controllers, so that's uh, idle. And then you've got rudder, for some reason the undercarriage, which doesn't have retracts, uh, it, it's, it's set on channel five. And then six and seven are the extra um, Ailer and, and elevators, the, the two, the two right-hand ones. Now that's a default, um, and, and in my view, that's not an ideal way of, of programming things. And you can change that. Um, and it, it, again, it shows here on, on, on the thing called the function screen. Uh, so you've got ailer and elevator, throttle rudder, gear, and then ailer and two, and elevator two on channel six and seven. Um, my opinion is that there's a better way of setting that up. Um, and, and the reason is this, when you're, th th this shows the sticks deflected um, and the two you see here are the two ailerons deflected downwards and deflected upwards. But the, the pitch is a little bit muddy because the, the, the gear, which is on a switch and, and the throttle are in the way. And it, it's quite hard sometimes to pick out which one you're looking at when you're, uh, when, when you're checking your servo directions and throws. And uh, they, they show elevators and <clears throat> excuse me, ailerons and elevators at full deflection. Um, a quick jump, and this is the one and only jump to, to my setup on my F3A plane. Um, that, that's a biplane, so it's got four aileron servos and two elevators and then the speed controller and rudder. And you notice I've assigned the channels uh, so that everything's in a row. So I've got the four aileron servos, uh, channels one to four, the two elevators on channels five and six, and then the ESC and rudder. So when I operate the aileron stick, I can see the first four bars will appear up or down. And if I pull the elevator stick, I push it, the two elevators uh, go in opposition. Uh, so that's just much easier to see. So if you can do it on your radio, and, and you, can, you can on the 16S set, set your two ailerons for channels one and two, uh, lump the elevators together. I've done that on four and five, the rudder's off at six. And I've left the throttle on three. And, and the reason I've done that um, is that the fail safe on, on the default setting on that transmitter is just for channel three. Um, so leave it there, but at least you've got the ailerons in, in a pair together and the elevators in a pair together. Um, so you can see it much more easily on the screen when you're programming. Now, uh, just, Going back a second, I, I touched on setting your servo arms and linkages up. Um, you, you can compensate for little errors here by using the sub trim to get the servo exactly at right angles, but I don't recommend you do that. And I often see a setup like this um, with, with various amounts of, of offset, four steps, one step, minus 14 here and plus three there. Uh, and that's, that's what you see then on your um, servo monitor screen and then when you come to start setting up control throws you get this sort of effect so the ailerons are now reading on full deflection 95 and 101 and the elevators are 86 and 103 so are they exactly the same well, well in fact they are um, but, it, but it's not as intuitive as if they were both reading 100 and then you move the opposite direction and now it's 104 and 99 and 113 and 96. Now I've done this on two screens deliberately. Can you remember what they were in the other directions? Because I can. But if, if you were looking for 100, you'd remember it. So they are deflecting equally. Um, 
So my, my advice here is no sub trims, do the work on the linkages uh, and make life easier for yourself a little bit later on. So there you go, that's your ideal sub trim setting and then forget about it. Um, moving on now to ATV. Uh, um, and, and this is another one where it, I think it's best to, to leave well alone. What you've got on ATV is uh, an absolute limit for each channel, so 135 in either direction percent of throw. Uh, but these are actually set to 100, and you, and you can change all of these limits uh, to different numbers. So if you, if you knew you wanted more left error than right, you could set 110 left and 100 right. And 110 left here and 100 right there. When you get to elevator, you've got to be careful because they go in opposite directions. So if you wanted 110 here, you'd have to put 110 here. An easy one to get wrong. And I've seen it done many a time. So you end up with somebody with more up elevator uh, on the left than on the right uh, and vice versa on down elevator. So if you want to program in corkscrew loops, that's a great way of doing it. So again, my advice, just leave that 100% um, and adjust things elsewhere further down. Uh, if 100% really is too much throw, uh, think about trying a different servo arm, either move it in a hole or try a smaller arm or use a longer control horn. It's only an issue if 100% actually binds your linkages and you hear the servo straining. Um, but ideally, just, just, just leave things alone at 100 and remember, as I said earlier, everything you do here um, is transferred across to every single flight condition that you use. I call it flight mode there, I meant to say flight condition. <coughs> okay, next one. This is the one where we do most of our programming to get the response of the aircraft um, in the way that you want it. So it's a really powerful function, there's lots to it and use it for most of your programming. So it's called different things with different brands, but for time we call it AFR. And here the example is for the Aileron channel. And you've got a little graphical representation of the stick. So the stick movement is here, um, in this case, full left and then full right. And then the response of the, of the channel, the servo, from minus 100 in a straight line through neutral up to plus 100. And that's called a linear response. And you can change it. Uh, you can change the rate of response on these two. That, that's the rate to the left and the rate to the right. You can offset the whole thing, the whole line up or down using that. I'm not going to cover that, but uh, it might be something that you want to do if you've got a plane that's susceptible to tip stalling. You want to raise the ailerons in a certain flight mode for, uh, for landing. Um, and then we can change the shape of this curve, which I'll show in a second. And that's done using the thing called exponential. And we've got exp A, exponential A, which covers this part of the, uh, the graph, and exp B, which covers that part. The X1 function is selected here, and there's a thing called separate here. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in another slide. Notice also it's a two screen function here. So there's, there's something on the second screen, which I'll briefly show. If you go on the second screen, you can change the, the function that you're programming to change from aileron to elevator to rudder, etc., etc. And then in Fataba, there's a thing called group. Or if you click on it, there's a thing called single. And if you select group and then go back to this, everything you change will be changed in every flight condition that you select. And if you, if you don't know about flight conditions, just hold that thought for now. But if you select single, any change you make here will only apply in that flight condition. And this is, called, this is condition one that I'm showing here. It's a new plane and the first flight condition. So that, that, that's an important thing to remember. So here I've set exponential and I've exaggerated it. It's, you wouldn't normally choose to fly with that amount of exponential, but it's a thing called X1 where the, the response is softened around the neutral. It's set to 75% in both directions. Um, just a word on conventions for Taba radios, uh, you have to put a negative value in to get the exponential shape here. 
Uh, JR use positive value. I'm not certain on the other makes, but uh, if, if you've got one, you'll, you'll very quickly work it out. But don't make the mistake of selecting a logarithmic response, which would be extremely sensitive around neutral and flattening off at the extremes, which, which just makes for a wild ride. I can't think of any circumstance where you want to do that. And typical sort of numbers. I've exaggerated that to show the curve, but typical numbers, uh, 30 to 50 percent exponent error and elevator, a little bit more on rudder because uh, often for aerobatics, you have quite a large rudder throw. So it just softens the neutral on that. Um, so I talked about separate and uh, combined a little earlier, just touched on that. This thing called separate there, and you can click on it. Um, and separate allows you to, as, as it suggests, set A and B to different numbers. So I've set different expos here. I've set a high expo value on the A side and a small value on the B side. It, it, it's not often used this, but sometimes in, in aerobatics, pilots use a little bit less exponential on down elevator, just so you've got a little bit of bite here uh, at the point where you roll the aircraft to inverted. Uh, and they use less expo um, on down elevator than up elevator. But um, I, I wouldn't do that to start with. I'd just try setting a small amount of expo and, and keep it equal. Uh, and what you can see here is a, is a combined mode, which makes life much easier because in combined, you only have to adjust one of these. And then the, if you adjust the A, the B will follow and vice versa. So um, whatever you do, you will get the same rate A and B and you'll get the same rate, A and B, uh, same expo on A and B in, in expo one in combined, which does make it uh, much easier. The other uh, modes, uh, there's one called exp2, uh, exponential two, <coughs> and that gives a, a different exponential response, which is over the entire curve from, uh, or the entire stick range from, <coughs> oh, excuse me, frogging my throat, uh, from one end to the other. Uh, and that's typically used on, uh, on your speed controller or throttle. Uh, <coughs> IC engines have, uh, have a, uh, a carburetor, uh, which is often quite responsive at low openings and less so at high openings. So you, you offset that by programming a curve that sh is shaped like that, which gives you a little bit more sensitivity at the top. Electric motors are the other way. Uh, they tend to give a quite linear torque characteristic. Uh, and for most of us, uh, you need a little bit more response at the bottom end because a lot of your flying is done around this region uh, and it flatten off at the top and that gives a better flying characteristic. So oddly, uh, you know, if you're flying a plane with an engine with that shape and you're flying a plane with an electric motor with that shape, you would find in practice that your response is very similar in terms of aircraft speed uh, against stick position. Moving on now, um, getting towards the end, talk briefly about mixers. Uh, the two mixers that are used most in, in aerobatic flying, uh, and these are built in on, on most radios, you don't have to select which is, is the primary and the secondary function, but uh, in, in generic terms, a mixer, um, means that a secondary function will operate when a primary function is operated. So this example, the built-in one, you want the ailerons to move when you move the rudder. Uh, and in this case, it's to counteract an aerodynamic effect. If you apply rudder on, on many aerobatic models, uh, they will roll. They will either roll in the same direction as the rudder or they'll roll in the opposite direction, but they won't just hang uh, in, in the same roll axis. So we, we, we can use a mixer to, to correct for that. Um, the key thing here is with rudder and aileron, if you set both the numbers to a negative value, you get a straight line. It'll either rise uh, from right to left if you set a negative value, or it will rise from left to right if you set a positive value. Uh, and depending on which you've set, this will mean that when you move the rudder, uh, the aileron's will either go in the opposite direction in this, this instance, or in the same direction if you set a, a positive rate. So we see that in practice here. Uh, rudder's been moved. We've moved look, rudder left. Apologies. Um, and the, the, the two ailerons have moved to the right. And then we've moved the rudder up here to the right 
and then the two ailerons have moved to the left according to the amount of mix set in. So that's, uh, that's rudder aileron. The second built-in one is, is rudder to elevator. Um, and this, this one is different. You always set a V shape here. It's either a, a positive V or a negative V. And again, it depends whether you want the, uh, the elevators to move up or down with rudder. But you, what, what you need with rudder is um, when you deflect to the left, in this case, you want the up elevator. When you deflect to the right, you also want up elevator, hence, hence the V shape. So one's negative and one's positive. And that's used in aerobatics to counteract pitching in knife edge flight generally. With all mixes, uh, just mention it here, um, you, you do have the option of switching a mix in and out. Uh, again, my recommendation uh, is not to do that. If, if you, it, it's just something else to remember uh, and, you, and you won't remember it when it's important. So leave it in all the time um, and, and learn to fly your aircraft with the, the unwanted characteristics mixed out. If on the other hand you, you, you think you've programmed the mix and, and you go back to your, your servo monitor screen and nothing's happening uh, and you start scratching your head, it's quite likely um, you haven't actually activated the mixer. So you, 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 you set all the mixes up and there's usually a second screen where it's either inhibited or activated or set by a switch. Uh, and you know, just go and check, make sure it's not been left inhibited select it to act activated and then just forget all about it and then then, then you just adjust the mix according to what you uh, what you want with uh, with test flights so here's the example with rudder to elevator mix again uh rudder moving to the left and the elevators remember for, for the elevators to go up one of these bars moves down and one moves up and that's showing 100 percent rudder and 10 percent up elevator uh, and this one's showing right rudder and also 10% up elevator. Just the same as on that screen. So that, that's, that's the outcome. Now, all these things, all these AFRs are selected on and off by using things called flight conditions. Um, again, other brands have something similar, um, uh, but I'm not an expert on that. So I, I can only really talk with confidence about Fataba. So this is, the, this is a, quite a lot of flight conditions, but a couple of them are, are based around uh, the, uh, an electric motor uh, ESC here. Um, the normal condition is the default, and that's the one you do most of your flying on. And I've set up one with stall turn. I've set up one for snap rolls. I've set up a condition for spin. I've set further ones for arming the speed controller and, and finally a throttle cut. And... Here we do use switches to select the conditions we want for the various phases of flight. So you can see here, I've started to set up that switch A is being used uh, and you will see on the next screens where, where I've set the others up. Uh, don't set too many because again, in the heat of the moment, you'll forget uh, which, which switch operates which, then you'll be taking your eyes off the plane, you'll be taking your hands off the control sticks, uh, none, none of which are a good idea. You need to learn uh, to be able to operate these switches without looking down or without letting go of the sticks. It's, uh, it, it really is important to do that. So remember that trims and subtrims and things don't change when you select between these, but the AFR, the ones I've just shown you in detail, can be set differently in each condition. So here's what we do. Uh, I fly mode two, which is probably alienated about 40 or 50 percent of the people uh, who are tuned in at the moment um, but uh, you know other stick modes are available and, and and there are great pilots who fly mode one mode two three four and everything in between so I'm, I'm not, not going to engage in in that debate but this is what I use for mode two uh, and I and that is obviously uh, aileron and elevator on the right stick I do most of the switching between flight conditions on the left stick. So if I try to just hold my radio glance at the screen for a moment, obviously I'm, I'm mirror image here. I'm flying the Owens elevator here. I do most of my switching on this one here, which is switch A on a Fataba, and then switch B uh, for, for other functions. Um, and I can reach those um, with my middle finger on the left hand without uh, upsetting the, the the operation of a left stick too much. 
So the normal default, switch A in the up position, uh, use that for ne nearly all parts of the flight. Um, stall turn is one click down on, on the left switch, switch A. Um, and that simply has an AFR with a much greater rudder throw and more exponential uh, to help the aircraft go over a stall turn. Snap roll uh, is the next click down on, on switch A uh, here uh, and the third position. Uh, and that has much more aileron throw for a snap roll. So it's double or treble your normal throw uh, and a little less elevator and rudder to, to get a clean snap roll. And that's switched in or out um, to, to achieve that. Then we go up the next switch in, the longer one, which you can, you can uh, you know, differentiate between the A and the B by the length of the stick, just by feel. Centre position on that is for a spin, which has more elevator throw and a little less aileron to get a clean spin. Uh, but everything else is just the same. Uh, and that, that's it for the flying surfaces. And then we move across to the switches on the right, because these are the ones that are operated pre-flight and post-flight. Um, so the arming function for the speed controller, I've got a screen on that in a moment. Um, and then finally one for throttle cut, which I've got another screen on as well. So those of you experienced with speed controllers will know that they, they have an arming position, which is usually beyond the, the, the zero at the low end. So the normal curve for throttle would be that from 100% at the top with a uh, positive expo and 100% at the bottom, which is usually uh, a windmilling propeller for, for most aircraft. Sometimes a brake function, but again, beyond, beyond the scope of tonight. To arm the speed controller, you, you, instead of being in normal mode, you go to flip the switch on the right hand side and put it in arm mode. In this case, the rate at the bottom has been increased to 125%. And that drives the signal to the speed controller down even lower. And then you get your, your beep uh, or multiple beeps when the speed controller arms. So that, that, that sets that and you then flip back up with it, with it armed and you're back in your normal operating mode. Cut is useful for ground handling. In fact, I'd say it's pretty well essential for ground handling. Um, and and you, you really do use the capability of your radio here. So pick a switch on the top, because your aircraft's on the ground, you're not holding the sticks, you're not operating the flying surfaces. And set the rates down to zero. Uh, and this offset, I've, I've driven that, the, you know, the, the rate goes from this, from a slope here to, to a flat response. Offset then drives it down to the bottom end of the range. Uh, ignore that. 5% X, but I just left that on from the previous screen. That's a mistake. It doesn't matter where that's set because the rates are zero. And that then wherever your stick position is, the output is 120% on the negative side uh, and, and your motor will not run at all. So that's great for uh, handling your aircraft when, when, while somebody's carrying it out um, pre-arming. Uh, pre it doesn't matter where, if you drop the transmitter, the sticks will move, uh, but your motor's not going to go. So that's a good safety function. Uh, and almost finally, uh, timer. Um, every radio's got a timer. They're all slightly different, but do use it. Um, I, I remember one instance when I was, uh, I was teaching somebody, and they, they were using the iPhone uh, in the pocket. Uh, and I, I don't want to get involved in the debates about phones on flight lines, but I don't know whether it's transmitting. But using an iPhone as a timer when your transmitter's got, got one built in. Uh, is, 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 is really not the best thing to do. So learn your timer functions um, and, and use the capacity. You, use the capacity of your fuel tank. Use the capacity of your battery. Don't land after four minutes and then say, oh, my battery's at 60%. You, 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 you're wasting, you're carrying dead weight around if you do that and, and, and you're not getting the benefit of, of a flight as long as it could be. Again, don't overdo it. Try to land at about 25% battery capacity for LiPos. Um, and if it, it, with a new aircraft and set, if you don't know where you are, set your timer at five minutes and then build up over subsequent flights. But, but aerobatic flights tend to be around eight minutes uh, maximum. So um, I set my timer for that. I have that on a, on a momentary switch to start it. Uh, most timers give you a beep every minute. And then when you get 30 seconds from your, 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 your allocated time, they start counting down uh, so that you know it's time to land. Uh, and there's all sorts of things you need. You can make the transmitter vibrate as well. Um, 
some types of radio uh, talk to you in a, in a nice voice and tell you how long you've got left as well. Um, we've, we've all been stood on the flight line next to those. So do, do use that function. That's, uh, that, that's all I want to mention on that one. Uh, and that is it, folks. Uh, I've no doubt there's some questions, but just before we move on to those, um, yeah, I've, I've talked this time about, about radio setup specifically. Uh, I've done previous sessions on aerobatic flying. If, if you, rather than noting down what I've said or looking back at the, the video recording of this, if you want a book to read, uh, I'm going to give a shameless plug here for... Uh, one of my GBRCA colleagues, Peter Jenkins, uh, who, who's written a book uh, about aerobatics, and it covers everything from that type of plane in the foreground, the Watt 4, to the Fantasister at the back, um, all sorts of things about aircraft, flying techniques, the effect of wind, a little bit about setting radios up, what to expect at a competition. It's available, as they say, from all good booksellers, and there's a Kindle version available too, uh, and it, the second edition will be out very soon, so it might be worth hanging on for that. Um, but uh, but well worth a read for pilots at all levels. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, a, a lot of slides uh, gone through quite quickly again. Uh, hope it's been uh, uh, you, you've been able to follow it. Um, I'll stop talking for a minute, get my voice back, and uh, we'll we'll have a look at through some questions. Kevin, many many thanks. Um, I think it's a, a tribute to the presentation that there's only been four questions because I think everybody's just been listening. So oh, um, I, I, think all the <laughs> I think all the questions will come firing in. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of easy ones for you. You can't have much of a break and uh, and I'm sure Paul will get involved if I start coughing and sneezing. Um, Chris Searle, do you do you fly using only thumbs or thumb and index finger? Uh Right, uh, a bit of a hybrid for me. Um, I, I, th I thought I was a uh, pinching the sticks sort of uh, flyer, but when I looked, actually, my thumb's on the top of the stick, uh, and I use my index finger to guide it as well. Uh, so, so a bit of a combination between the two. Uh, it, it's very much like the stick, the, it's the stick modes argument. Um, so, some aerobatic flyers use a tray and finger and thumb. Uh, some use an extra strap and thumbs, and uh, if you run back through world champions, European champions, there's a mixture of techniques. So neither is better or worse than the other. But I use finger and thumb. Paul, oh, can I ask you what you what you use? Uh, yeah, I, I just use my thumbs. Um, always have done. Uh, my, my hands were never big enough to cradle the sticks when I was about five, so I had to just stick my thumbs on the top. Mainly because my dad had his fingers around the base of the stick, so I didn't crash. Well, there you go, guys. There we there we have it. Adrian Heseldane, um, how do the flight conditions on the two switches interact with each other? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking that, <clears throat> Adrian. Um, th there is a priority for all the different flight conditions which you can adjust. So you, you can have, uh, for example, um, cut being the highest priority so no matter what any of the other switches are in if you select cut that will override so there is a pecking order uh, oddly enough on the fatab it runs from top to bottom so it, if, if there was the seven functions there if you set if you set cut at seven that's 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 the one that's the highest priority uh if cut's not set it'll look for six and so on um so uh you do need to make sure that that um, you haven't got, say, the, uh, the, the speed controller arm left set, and then you wonder why it doesn't go into snap mode when you, when you flick that down. So set them up and have a little, little play around by moving the switches into different positions and see what comes up on the screen, because the condition is displayed on the screen. Thank you. Trevor Waters, uh, why, why do the elevator servos move in opposite directions? Um, it, it, they, they just do, um, and, and you use the reversing function if, if they don't. Um, if you think about it with the ailerons, um, if you look at the bottom of the aircraft, the, the aileron servos will both go clockwise, and, and one aileron will pull down, the other one will push up, and that gives you your rolling action. 
whereas with elevators, you want them both to go up together and down together, which is why that they, they move in opposite directions. <coughs> it's just one of those things you, you've got to get used to on the screen. Um, and and uh, probably because I went through it quite quickly, some of the earlier screenshots I took, uh, I mistakenly had the elevator servos going up together and down together. And, and that's because I didn't plug any servos in and, and actually check it. Uh, hope, I hope that answers it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back if not. Malcolm Balfour, hi Kevin, great presentation. Have you experimented with activating flight modes with logic? So moving the sticks to a certain position to activate, say, a snap flight mode. Yeah, hi, hi, hi Malcolm, uh, you know, uh, fe fellow competition flyer. Um, I, I, do, I do use logic uh, on my snap function or on my 32MZ radio. Uh, I haven't deliberately haven't gone into that tonight um, because I think that's that, that's a you, you need to be reasonably advanced in aerobatics to, to do that. But you can activate uh, the, the, for example, the, the high response rate on aileron. Uh, you can set that to come in if, when you push the stick over and it reaches 80 percent and suddenly it will automatically switch the higher rate rather than flicking switches on the transmitter, uh, which a lot of people use at, uh, at sort of national and international level richard wood has asked do you use aileron differential <laughs> uh, yes and no so, some aircraft um seem to need a little but the majority of aerobatic aircraft that i've flown um rarely need very much depends on the aircraft type you you, you would certainly need aileron differential to get a good coordinated turn on a higher spec ratio glider, power glider, or something like that. Uh, but for precision aerobatics, it, it's part of trimming, uh, but I generally don't have much, if any, differential on my aircraft. Another question, I think, logic uh, about logic, Russ Bowie, what about logic switches? I guess it's part of the previous question, but. Yeah, it, it, it follows on from Malcolm's question yep. again, uh, Russ, Russ a, fe a fellow aerobatic player. You, you can use a logic function um, uh, with, a, with a switch. So the, the example that, that, that we're probably looking for, again, it's for the snap roll function. I don't want the snap roll function available at all times in case when I'm coming into land, uh, I suddenly have to push the sticks in the corner to counteract the dust. I don't want the snap rate coming in then or, or I'll be collecting a, a bag of bits off the ground. So I... I have a logic to set the snap, but I have an arming switch for that. So when I pull the, the, the top left switch, the A switch down into snap roll, uh, all he's doing is arming the logic uh, for when I move the sticks over to 80% uh, elevator and aileron. And then I switch it out after I've finished the, the snap roll maneuver. Thank you. Um, I knew this question would come up. Michael Kitchen, have you always used Futaba? Or are there other modern alternatives that you would you would consider, Paul? You might want to get involved in this one. <laughs> well, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll go first. Uh, I, I, I started my my flying career quite a long time ago uh, with home built radio, um, and then for those that have been around a long time, I moved on to Sanwa, and then I had JR, um, and. Uh, I moved on to Fatawa in 1995, and I've been there ever since. Um, uh, as I say, I, I, I'm, I'm not in the business of knocking other brands. I think all radio nowadays is, is very good. Uh, but I've used Fatawa for such a long time that I'm familiar with it, and, and I wouldn't contemplate changing now. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Peter Jenkins is actually in the room, and he's just pointed out, which we don't mind letting everybody know, that <laughs> the book is actually available only on Amazon, I believe. Uh, and he's suggesting the paperback version is, is better because the photographs and the pictures are in coloured. Uh, they're coloured and they're not scrambled. Um, and it's been updated to 2022. So, yeah. um, my, my slide shows 2002. Well spotted, Peter. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so I think, uh, Peter, you might get a few orders in there. Stuart Meller, hi Kevin, have you used uh, logic for snaps etc or do you prefer switches? Uh, I, I think I've just answered. You've answered that one, that. Yeah. 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 I've done that one. Uh, yeah, you've answered that one. Right, so 
you've answered three in one go there. You're doing really well. Michael Kitchen, would you prefer to leave all the arms intact or balance or cut off all but the one in use? I guess it's uh, the servo arms you're talking about. Yeah, um, I, I, I tend to leave them unless they get in the way. Um, <clears throat> just out of laziness. So if I, if I went back 20 slides, it'd show the, uh, you'd see the six arm on, on, on the air and on the, uh, on the leader biplane because uh, that's got a Z-bend through it and, and nothing's going to catch on, on any of the other spokes. Um, so, But if they do get in the way, just chop them off. Um, you, you, you only need the one that's connected to the push rod. Peter Ulig uh, asks, what about logic switches for snap rolls together with changing flight conditions with different rates? No manual yeah. switching necessary. Yeah, hi Peter. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I probably covered it in, in the in the earlier answer to uh, to, to Russ, um, uh, and 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 as as you and I know, there's there's many different ways of doing it, and uh, I, I do use uh, the logic function for snaps. Thank you, uh, John North. Good good introduction. I seldom get the servo arms at ninety degrees. Do you? Do you set up the throws to compensate for this and make the movements the same? Um, yeah, it, it, if if they're a long way out, and they sometimes are, if you're using a single arm uh, or using a, a long reach arm or a metal arm or something like that, you haven't got a lot of choice. Sometimes you're three or four degrees out. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't sub trim that away. I measure the control throws after connecting the linkage, and if there's any gross difference, um, I do um, trim that out using the ATV function. But I, I didn't want to cloud the the presentation tonight with with that uh, that bit of complexity. If you're only three or four degrees out from neutral, uh, you'd be surprised how little difference it makes at normal deflection. Most of the uh, geometric errors that you get are due to the control horn not being at right angles to the hinge line rather than the servo arm not being at right angles to the uh, the push rod, in my experience. Thank you. John Smith, he asked a question very early on here. Has anyone had problems with the trims being reversed on a Radio Master TX16S? Ooh, you, you, you beat me on that one, John. Um, the, the, the may the may be a reverse but by can, can I just ask you, you you you'll have to type another question do you mean the the trim next to the throttle operates the elevator or the actual direction of the trim is is, is opposite to the stick uh, maybe you can type type uh, an, another question uh, while while I deal with another one yeah I, I think actually uh, John, John was saying that He'd actually had problems with uh, his radio where the trims were being reversed, um, but it's a it's a Radio Master TX sixteen S, so that's not you, you you won't know that one. I wouldn't have thought it's not Futaba. Yeah, there's a there's a thing called cross trimmed, which is the first example I gave. Um, that some people used to like that, where where the the trim that, that is next to the rudder uh, stick, sorry, to, next to the throttle stick operates the elevator and, and the one next to the elevator operates the throttle, uh, which allows you to trim while still holding the elevator stick. Um, uh, that, that's sort of f fallen out of use over the years, that one. Most people like, like the, the trim that's actually next to the stick to operate that axis. But as for them working wrong way around, I, I, I'm afraid that's, uh, that, that's beaten me, that one. On. With, with, with your, sorry, with, with your servo horn set up, um, it was asked earlier on about the position of where you put uh, your control rod on the horn, either on the inner hole or to the outer hole. I and mean, obviously on the inner hole, the servo gives you more torque. But where, where would you base your connection? Um, it, it, it's all, yeah, the, ne the nearer to the centre, the, the better. Um, um, but you, you, you need to get the right amount of throw. It is, it, if you noticed, I used... Fairly on, on the on the F3A plane, the, um, uh, the the six arm servo arm that I used is quite a small um, length of servo arm, uh, but on a hundred percent throw, 
uh, that gives me plenty for snap rolls with with the length of control on. And it's it's a it, it's a combination of the two, isn't it? It's the uh, the, the length from the the axis of the servo to the uh, the push rod uh, compared with the uh, the control horn to the hinge point. But uh, I generally get enough throw uh, for the most violent manoeuvres with 100%. If you're flying a big uh, 3D type plane with large control surfaces, they often require um, long horns and, and quite often gang servos to get the power to do that. Uh, so I can really only speak for, for precision F, F3A flying. But the, the key point is, uh, don't, don't if you've got an arm that's too small, don't <coughs> dial everything up to 150% to compensate. Put the right arm on. Thank you. And then quite quite early on, uh, William Anderson asked, this is probably a different, uh, a different evening for you, but do you use the S-Bus at all? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, do, I do use S-Bus. So uh, on, my, on my current aircraft, uh, say it's a, it's a four servo, uh, or four ailer and biplane, um, the, each pair of servos is driven from a single lead. Uh, and then down the back, I've got my two elevator servos and the rudder servos, and they're all driven from a single lead on S-Bus. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's another level that one. Uh, ha happy to talk about that, but uh, it'd probably be a smaller audience. You got thirty seconds. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, not, for, not. well, it, it's good to hear. We we have a, an open TX. Uh, somebody who knows the answer to this, uh, Richard Grimshaw, responds to uh, John Smith's question uh, to answer the TX sixteen question. Reverse the servo in the open TX outputs output section. So, John, hopefully, I know you've come back to us. Hopefully, that aren't, answers it um, for you. Let's let's see how they go. Yeah. That. That, that, thanks to Richard for helping me with that one. It's uh, it was outside of my yeah, knowledge base. Uh, Stuart Meller, Kevin, do you do you want to comment on the amount of throws required for aerobatics? Uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's a little bit of um, uh, ground I covered uh, last time, but it was, it was over a year ago. Uh, the, the glib answer is about half as much as you think. Um, uh, smooth aerobatics can be flown with, 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 with not a lot of control throw. So it is quite small. Typically, um, uh, as I've just been talking about the air and throw on my biplane, 100% gives, gives a pretty quick snap roll. But most of my flying is done on 30% air and uh, so the deflection is about four or five millimetres um, at, at the end of the air and not a lot. But it's uh, but it's it's plenty to uh, to fly aerobatics. Uh, Eugene Anker, uh, Kevin, <coughs> are you using the same or similar throttle curve with different speed controllers and different motors, or do you always use the same motor and speed controllers? Uh, yeah, good one. Um, different different types of electric motor and drive systems have different responses. Um, so I currently use a, a contra drive, which is a, a reduction gear and a belt. <clears throat> and that has a, a, a very different characteristic from the single drive outrunner that I used before it. So it's got quite a different throttle curve and a much, much higher idle on a contra drive, um, which is, which is it, the, the flight idle is too much to land on. So uh, they are quite different. And, and I have, um, within the conditions, I have different throttle settings for spin um, and landing. Um, uh, compared to normal flight. Thank you very much. Um, we're on to the last couple of questions, so timing's going brilliantly well here. Colin Upshur, do you slave the nose wheel servo with the rudder servo? Um, uh, well, I, 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 I don't have nose wheels, but I think I, think I know the answer. For, for a tricycle undercarriage aircraft, uh, yeah, that, that, I think that's a good uh, uh, example where you'd use a mix. Um, uh, and, and drive the, the nose wheel uh, mixed to the rudder, but you might put in uh, a, a very much um, dampened neutral for, uh, for ground handling. It may, may vary with speed, I don't know. You, you probably need one of the, one of the jet experts uh, on the forum to help with that one. Russ Bowie asks, down elevator, only expo difference or throw difference as well? Uh, yeah, bit, bit of both, Russ. Uh, slightly increased throw and a slightly less expo, uh, typically. 
Um, I, I didn't want to uh, overcomplicate the, the presentation tonight, but I'm happy to show you my setup next time we're flying together. And the final question that we have at the moment from Michael Kitchen, what percentage C of G would you normally fly from the leading edge? That might be a tricky one for you. <laughs> Uh, depends on the aircraft. Uh, start with what the builder or manufacturer recommends, um, but uh, aer aerobatic trimming uh, will tell you whether it's uh, whether it's right. Usually, it's a, it's a good starting point, um, but depending on how the aircraft responds in in different types of flight, in upright, inverted, climbing, diving, knife edge, and such like, you would uh, find whether it's too far forward or back and adjust accordingly. One of the great things about electric aircraft with a, with a reasonably heavy battery in them is that you can do CAG adjustments uh, quite easily by moving the battery forwards or backwards. So it's not, it's not a very specific answer. It, it depends, but um, it, it's worth you know, spending some time to get the centre of gravity in the right place because it makes everything I've talked about tonight much easier and, and you'll need fewer mixes if you get it right. Kevin? That is brilliant. Thank you very much. You have cleared the question board. Um, Paul, thank you very much. We'll just just to let everybody know while we've still got 163 in the room, you, you top 215, I think, I spotted in terms of, uh, so I think that's a fabulous, fabulous turnout. Um, just to let everybody know, we are on next week. Um, we will announce, uh, it's a little, little bit of a, a secret because we haven't written the paperwork for it yet, but uh, we will get the paperwork out. Barry will be back next week, so will Andy as well. Um, but yeah, I'd like to thank Paul and Kevin for, you know, fan fantastic. Really, really enjoyed that. I thought that was one of the best sessions we've had in a long, long time. And, um, you know, 25 questions is, is is pretty good. It kept everybody uh, pretty pretty much going on that. So um, we're getting lots of thanks coming in at the moment um, from everybody. Um, so I think I'm going to stop the recording because I think we're, you could probably do with a, a drink, Kevin. <laughs> Let me stop the recording. Yeah.